Our next speaker this morning is going to continue our oncolytic virus discussions, and she advised me not to say her last name. So <laughs> this is Elena. She'll be talking with us about uh, oncolytic viruses. Hi, everyone. So my name is Elaine. I currently work in Dr. Byron Bridal's lab in the Department of Pathobiology here at the University of Guelph. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our combination therapy using um, decidabine, which is an epigenetic modifier, and oncolytic virotherapy. So I'm kind of going to touch on um, Thomas's virus a little bit, but he's already done too good of a job explaining it. So before I start, I just want to give an acknowledgement. Um, my best friend Jaden actually passed away in September, or sorry, in March of 2017. He actually passed away after a seven-month battle against acute myeloid leukemia and three relapses. Um, so that's kind of why I got into blood cancer research and why I ambushed Byram for the uh, grad studies. And uh, so I just wanted to leave an acknowledgement slide. So with that being said, I'm quite familiar with the current standard of care in human medicine. Um, and typically, so just to show a little bit about kind of how strenuous this can be on patients, um, this little boy Oliver, he's featured here with his beads of, beads of courage, sometimes referred to as beads of bravery. So each bead depicts a different event in their treatment regimen. So for example, one girl went into isolation and she got a bead with a teddy bear. Another boy got, uh, he started to lose his hair, so he got a bead with someone basically balding. Um, another girl traveled on a train for some of her chemo treatments, so she got a train on that bead. Um, so it just shows really how many treatments and events during their treatment they have to undergo right now. Um, and with that being said, typically the current standard of care starts with a minor surgery. So they'll get what's called a central venous catheter, sometimes referred to as a Hickman. It goes in at the chest area and basically it prevents patients from having to constantly get new needles to get blood drawn and to get IVs in. Um, it is a minor surgery, but still a surgery nonetheless. Next, they'll undergo remission induction. Because they're looking to treat acute leukemias, they are quite aggressive. Um, typically, they go into uh, remission induction almost right away. With Jaden, it was about 24 hours from his diagnosis. And they call it seven and three. So basically, you'll get two types of chemo drugs. The first one being something like, for example, cytarabine for seven days. And the last three of those seven days, they typically like to give anthracyclines. Um, such as doxorubicin or donorubicin, for example. And after you're in remission, it typically takes about, it can be up to two months in hospital, depending on the patient. Um, and then you'll get consolidation therapy. So this can be a wide range of things. It can consist of radiation therapy. It can consist of um, mutation-targeted drugs, like if you have the FLT3 mutation. Um, it can also consist of low doses of chemotherapy, which is one of the more common ones. And this is just to keep patients in remission. Next, many leukemia patients will have to undergo a stem cell transplant. Um, this can either be allogenic or autologous. Allogenic transplants um, typically have a bit higher of a survival rate at the five-year mark. The problem is that if you don't find a match that's related to you, you need to be a match on 12 human leukocyte antigen markers, I believe something like that. Um, so it can be hard to find a donor if you don't have siblings that are a match to you. So sometimes they can also do um, autogenous transplants, and they're doing really cool things actually with ex vivo therapies. Uh, but basically what they'll do is they'll actually take the stem cells from the patient, they'll purge them ex vivo of leukemic cells, and they'll reintroduce it back to the patient. Um, so it's important to appreciate our, the drugs that we use. So before, oops. Okay, that was supposed to be a time-lapse video that was gonna play, but it doesn't appear to be working. Um, but basically, we use two types of virus, uh, two types of therapy, or reagents, sorry. One of which Thomas has already covered, oncolytic viruses, so I'm not gonna go over them. This was supposed to be a time-lapse video that basically showed cells expressing GFP as they get infected. Um, and I only showed the first 24 hours, but if you watch the full 72, you can actually see the cells die off, which is pretty cool. Um, it also allows you to visualize it in real time. And we also use epigenetic modifiers. So as Thomas um, alluded to, this is one thing that's approved actually in human medicine for monotherapy, um, for acute myeloid leukemia, uh, albeit with limited efficacy and high rates of relapse. Um, so what it actually does is it reactivates some of the silenced genes that, that the cancer actually mutates and basically hypermethylates. 
Um, so it inhibits the methylation of newly synthesized DNA. With that being said, it only works on um, proliferating cells, so it does not target the cancer stem cell niche. Um, but some oncolytic virotherapy does. It can target cancer stem cell markers. So it's also important to appreciate the type of uh, cancers that we're treating. So I'm gonna be referring to them as TALL and AML throughout the presentation. TALL being T-cell acute lymphocytic leukemia coming from um, basically the T lymphocytes shown here in the lymphoid lineage, whereas AML comes from um, the myeloid lineage. So getting into our treatment regimen, we start by giving, depending what we're trying to actually induce in the mice, if we wanna give them TALL, we'll typically give about 100,000 EL4 cells. If we want to induce AML, we'll typically give about a million C1498 cells. Again, those were just optimized to be a lethal dose and controls. Um, typically, we'll wait seven days for the leukemic cells to engraft so that the mice are actually tumor bearing or rather leukemia bearing. Um, and we'll give decidabine on day eight. So decidabine goes intraorbital. It does have a very, very short half-life. Um, so we do give it in two doses. We wait 24 hours and we give it again. Now, in order to separate the treatments a little bit in time, um, we do give NDV three days later, although that's not a huge separation, that's just kind of what we had optimized treatment for. Um, and we basically push the dose at about 1.0 times 10 to the eight platforming units of NDV. So that's how all the following data was generated. And as you can see, our combination therapy induces durable remissions in both models of leukemia. So um, you can see here up top in the AML model, we get survival out to about a day 110 here. These mice actually were rechallenged at day 60. I'm not going to show um, the data, but I'm showing some VSV rechallenges next. But as you can see, it does achieve quite durable remissions in both models. And next, anybody who works in um, uh, leukemia and the type of area there, you'll know that relapse disease is huge. Um, as I mentioned, Jaden relapsed three times in seven months. So we really wanted to know if our treatment is indeed conferring resistance to relapse disease in rodent models. So what we actually did was we rechallenged mice that survived the initial treatment. And again, this is using a different oncolytic virus. This is using VSV, um, courtesy of Rob Mould. And basically, you can see 100% of the mice survived. Of course, we'd want to do this with a few more uh, mice mm -hmm. in a bigger scale study, but it is quite promising results thus far. So next, um, we wanted to see kind of how strong the memory response was. So we would normally inject 100,000 EL4 cells into mice. Um, instead, we rechallenged them with 1 million cells. So we put quite a leukemic burden on them, and we actually still had a 40% survival. Um, but what we wanted to do then was see if this immunological memory was in fact leukemia specific. So we actually took these um, survivors here, and we rechallenged them with one third of the dose of AML cells. So we took our TALL survivors and we rechallenged them with AML, so a different type of leukemia. As you can see, they didn't really survive much longer than controls. So it is a leukemia specific immunological memory. Um, in literature right now, it's already been reported um, that decidabine pretreatment sensitizes cells to oncolytic virotherapy. So what we wanted to do was instead of simply pre-treating cells and then doing the type of resazurin assay that's usually done, we actually took um, mice that were treated with decidabine monotherapy that were at endpoints. So the drug should have been completely out of their system at this point. And we basically collected the, the we harvested the brains of these mice and we collected these brain-derived decidabine surviving cells and we separated them out using the RAF flow cytometer and pathobiology and we figured out that um, indeed the, the phenomenon does hold true. They are still more resistant to, or more sensitive to oncolytic virotherapy. So something we actually wanna do in the future is to go in vivo with the brain-derived EL4 cells and see if it actually um, changes our survival statistics. So we reported a different mechanism of action. So prior to this, literature um, reported that the decidabine surviving phenomenon and the decidabine pretreatment was due to defects in type one interferon signaling, um, which is very common. The virus can get in much easier with defects in interferon signaling. We actually report that it's a um, increase in reactive oxygen species production. So decidabine actually upregulates um, reactive oxygen species. So we generated decidabine surviving cells um, that basically killed off 90% of them. Only the 10% that were left were the decidabine surviving cells. We cultured those up for a few weeks, froze them down, and used them for these experiments. So what we wanted to do was we actually wanted to test this. There's a few lines missing. <laughs> um, we actually wanted to test this in vivo. So what we did was 
Um, what we did was we actually co-administered a pan-reactive oxygen species scavenger known as n cysteine And the two important lines here, I guess you can see, um, basically it almost completely abrogated therapeutic efficacy. So when you do scavenge up all those reactive oxygen species, it does have a significant impact on your therapy. And something I want to do in the future is actually um, dissect which reactive oxygen species are responsible. So we've ordered the reagents to do different um, assays for this and basically fine-tune versus a pan-reactive one. So in conclusion, um, now it's important to take this with a grain of salt and realize we've only done this in mouse models. So the current standard of care slide that I presented at the beginning was human medicine. This slide is more depicting what we've achieved in mouse trials. Um, so we basically have two doses of decidamine, one dose of oncolytic virus. It's three days total of injections, four if you include the engraftment cells. Um, but basically, decidamine is clinically approved as monotherapy in human trials, which is why we're so interested in that, because it's a lot easier to come in with one novel therapeutic than two. Um, and we actually achieved durable remissions and resistance to relapse disease in mouse models, as seen. Um, and then just in conclusion, I want to give a little bit of an acknowledgement to uh, my advisor, Dr. Byron Bridal, seen here on our picnic day, um, and my lab team, in particular, Jacob Van Vlotten, Dr. Megan Strachan Whaley, and Dr. Khalil Karimi, who personally mentored me throughout the course of my grad degree, um, as well as our virus production team, Thomas McOslin, who just spoke, and Dr. Lisa Santry, and our animal care staff, who this would absolutely not have been possible without. And I'll take questions. Yeah, so, I mean, one would hope it pushes through and gets approval, but our next steps, we're kind of looking to work um, with Paul and the Animal Cancer Center, um, hopefully push this through to some companion animal trials, and uh, as Jim mentioned, kind of get safety in those trials. We've already worked out safety details in mice, um, but it'll be a different story when we go into dogs if we get there, so that's kind of the goal by the end of my uh, grad degree. Uh, we actually, so after treatment with, are you talking about the decidabine monotherapy or the combo? Any of them. So in our combination, we actually did uh, flow cytometry at endpoint, or we've euthanized them at a certain point in time. And I didn't show the data here just for time restraints, but we actually showed that there were no residual leukemia cells. So we used a congenic marker um, to find them, but we actually showed in our combination there's no residual leukemia cells. In the monotherapies, there are residual leukemia cells. Yes, um, and I mean, again, the problem here is, right, decidabine's in trials right now, but the problem is that it has such high rates of relapse um, out past, like, the five-year mark, right? And the problem with oncolytic viruses is they work great in solid tumors, but with leukemia, it's spread throughout normal tissues that can quench viral infections, right? So I do think if those monotherapy mice were left, um, I do think they would get uh, res um, relapse disease, which we've actually shown in our survival curves. They don't survive. Every single one of them dies. Um, when our, our combinations survive. But that might be a really good model to see if uh, oncolytic virus by itself can deal with that relapse. We've tested that they, they can't. Um, yeah, so we've done tons of survival studies, and again, we're, we're really pushing that dose of oncolytic virus um, just to the point of where it's not cytotoxic. So we give fluids every roughly three hours to six hours. Um, so we couldn't also push the dose any higher, which is something we wanted to try is even lowering it. And eventually at some point we want to try some kind of viral mimic like poly IC to see if maybe it just needs to think there's virus there. It doesn't actually need a virus itself. Do you virus the blood barrier? Uh, I believe the student prior to me did that research, but that was before my time, so I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I know stuff was done with that, but it was the PhD student prior to me, so. Given that uh, cytosine methylation is uh, important in terms of memory formation, my understanding is, is that some of the aversion to using epigenetic modifiers like the cytobine in human treatments is uh, because of cognitive impairment. Do you see any behavioral differences in your mice that have had the cytobine treatment? In combination, no. In monotherapy, uh, yes. There's a lot of cognitive issues. 
um, they start to get hind limb paralysis, stuff like that, their body kind of doesn't really function properly. But in combination, we actually don't see any um, cognitive deficits, which was interesting. Thank you. Right. <laughs> Final speaker this morning before our break um, is Avery Robinson, oh. and she um, oh, is from the Department of oh, I touched it. Molecular and Cellular Biology. So I'm going to jump track a little bit and talk to you about bacteria. So thank you. Um, I'm Avery. I work in the Allen Broca Laboratory that primarily focuses on the human gut microbiome. And my research focuses on Fusobacterium nucleatum and its role in colorectal cancer. And today I'm going to be presenting some very preliminary data on the potential to target virulent colorectal cancer-linked Fusobacterium nucleatum with a predatory bacterium, Delavibrio, and like organisms, or BALOs. So colorectal cancer is among the most commonly diagnosed and lethal cancers in Canada, and its incidence is expected to rise in adults under 50, as well as globally by 2030, um, due to the um, adoption of the Western lifestyle spreading throughout the world. Uh, additionally, this is a particularly lethal disease, and uh, one of the reasons for this, oh, this slide changing isn't working. Ooh, it's just delayed. So one of the reasons for this is that it's particularly difficult to diagnose this disease at early stages. Um, and in, this is significant as late stage diagnosis of colorectal cancer is linked to poorer overall disease survivability. So this is the stage of diagnosis, uh, stage of colorectal cancer at diagnosis in Canadian men and women between 2011 and 2015. And you'll note that almost half of them are diagnosed at later stages and later stage is linked to a relatively poor five-year relative survival rate. Um, so colorectal cancer is further complicated by its complex etiology. There are a number of risk factors associated with developing this disease, including uh, ones that you can control, so your diet and your alcohol intake, and things that you can't, like your age and your genetics. Um, and further, this disease is complicated by the proximal colon microbiome. Um, and the human gastrointestinal microbiome is known to provide a lot of key benefits to us, like uh, expanding our metabolic repertoire and outcompeting opportunistic pathogens for physical and metabolic niches, but it has been noted to be skewed in colorectal cancer patients, um, and it's very complicated in terms of the metabolic processes that might contribute to disease progression. Fusobacterium nucleatum is one such member of the human gastrointestinal microbiome, Specifically, it resides within the oral cavity. Uh, it's an anaerobe, meaning it doesn't grow in the presence of oxygen, and it's gram-negative, meaning it has two cell membranes instead of just one. Um, it's a very heterogeneous uh, species in terms of its genotype and its phenotype, and it's also known to be a commensal. So normally, it doesn't do anything particularly beneficial or particularly harmful in our mouths, which is great because we likely all have this species. Uh, but it can be virulent, and it's uh, considered to be an opportunistic pathogen. It's uh, considered to be an opportunistic pathogen specifically in colorectal cancer, among other diseases and infections. So this um, is link was first found in 2012, two separate North American research groups, one of which included the Allen Verco lab, 
found that Fusobacterium nucleatum was more abundant in colorectal carcinomas compared to adjacent healthy tissue within the same patient. Um, since this discovery, there have been a number of different discoveries in terms of Fusobacterium and its link to colorectal cancer, including it's, um, it's, it's considered to be a disease passenger, meaning the disease is already present when Fusobacterium nucleatum arrives and promotes the pro-inflammatory and pro-cancerous state. Um, it's, also, its presence has also been linked to uh, poor disease survivability. So patients in a European colorectal cancer cohort were noted to have a poor disease survivability with high levels of Fusobacterium in, in their lesions compared to patients with low levels of Fusobacterium nucleatum in their lesions. Additionally, another research group in 2017 found that Fusobacterium um, in primary colon tumors as well as metastatic liver tumors suggesting that this bacterium not only survives for extended periods of time within the colon tumor environment, but could also travel with the tumor as it metastasizes. So now I'm going to jump track a little bit more and talk about Della Vibrio and like organisms, or BALOs, and their microbiology. So they're a really interesting bacterium because they're gram-negative, and they're small, even by bacterial standards, fitting through a 0.45 micrometer filter. Uh, they're also very highly motile. And these uh, prior to characteristics contribute to their predatory capabilities. They're very successful at predating other gram-negative bacteria. In particular, they're useful for biofilm clearance, potentially with the ability to clear biofilms more effectively than antibiotics. And additionally, they are bacteria-specific. They don't elicit any extensive damage to eukaryotic cells, and they've also been used to treat um, animal infections thus far, I believe, in uh, cow eye infections. So this is the unique life, style, uh, life cycle of Della Vibrio and like organisms, or Balos. Um, their life cycle starts with being in an attack phase where they're motile, they're looking for a prey, and then they find one. They attach, they penetrate, and they establish themselves. And when they establish themselves, that is within the periplasm between those two membranes of their gram-negative prey cell. Uh, then they grow in what is called a deloplast, causing the prey cell to round up. And uh, following that, they septate, so they divide into individual cells, they develop, they grow their flag, uh, flagella, and then they lyse their host cell and go out on the prowl for further prey. So the first question in this research is, well, Della Vibrio is well characterized in terms of its predation in model organism E. coli, um, but can it prey upon gram-negative Fusobacterium nucleatum? So there have been only two studies thus far suggesting that it can, and we wanted to know specifically can it prey upon our inflammatory bowel disease and colorectal cancer isolated strains of Fusobacterium nucleatum. So to do this, uh, first we would prepare Fusobacterium nucleatum and Della Vibrio separately, and then co-incubate them aerobically, uh, grow the surviving Fusobacterium nucleatum anaerobically, as it is an anaerobe, and then count the Fusobacterium nucleatum colonies. So the results are in terms of how many Fuso survived the predation and survived the aerobic exposure. So what you're looking at here then is uh, colony counts of Fusobacterium nucleatum, um, either unexposed to air or bacteria, uh, the predatory bacteria, the purple bars. Uh, you're also looking at Fusobacterium exposed to air only, uh, three-hour control, orange bars, and Fusobacterium exposed to air and the predatory bacterium, the red bars. Now, what you should note first is that there were some strains of Fusobacterium nucleatum that did not survive the aerobic exposure very well. So that would be like 3127 and CC53, who just did not ex uh, survive as they are an anaerobic species. However, excitingly, there were a few strains of virulent Fusobacterium nucleatum that were preyed upon by the strain of Della Vibrio. Um, in particular, we were excited about 7-1 and its extensive predation compared to the uh, surviving cells exposed to air alone. So the previous data was from two biological replicates, and that's not going to convince anyone. So we decided to do some electron microscopy imaging of this predation to see if it's a real thing. So this is the strain 7-1 um, predated by that previous strain, Del Vibrio HD100. So here you can see um, the remnant of a Fusobacterium cell and these tiny Della Vibrio cells with their flagella, and these weird 
black tumor things that we couldn't really decipher by TEM, so we moved on to scanning electron microscopy. So a reminder, this is what Fusobacterium looks like. It is a long, spindle-shaped cell, very uh, thin, very tapered. Um, and when it's attacked by Della Vibrio, it, it forms these, again, this, just, this cell, a remnant here, and these Della Vibrio swarming it, and these weird bolus things that we, we don't really know what exactly is going on here. So zooming in on this area, to us at the Allen Verco Lab, it really looks like Della Vibrio is stealing Fusobacterium nucleatum's outer membrane, right? It exists between the two membranes of Fusobacterium nucleatum to complete its predatory life cycle. You can see it is draped somewhat in a, in a membrane here compared to this cell over here. So that the typical life cycle, again, is that the, in E. coli cells, the entire cell balls up to form this deloplast. So we're hypothesizing that because Fuso is so long and thin, there, that deloplast isn't able to form. So instead, like when you steal the sheets from someone you're sharing a bed with, uh, Fusobacterium nucleatum's outer membrane is stolen by Della Vibrio so that it can grow within it. So the question too then is that Fusobacterium nucleatum is an anaerobe, so, and uh, Della Vibrio is an aerobe, so how, how can this predation work? Um, so to avoid stressing Della Vibrio too much, we decided to give it its optimal host, its preferred E. coli, anaerobically to see if this predation can really occur. So uh, previous studies have been uh, done to see whether supplementation, like giving um, an alternative terminal electron acceptor, right? Like we use oxygen, Della Vibrio uses oxygen. Can we give it something else so that it can prey upon an anaerobic bacteria? Um, it does have several nitrite reductase genes, meaning it could possibly use nitrite. And various other studies have been done looking at supplementing Della Vibrio HD100 with glucose, with nitrate, and found that it works, but then another study found that it didn't, so the literature on this is really confusing, so thought, okay, let's just repeat it and see if we can get it to work. So the um, experimental protocol looks exactly like the previous one, except E. coli is the prey, and we're using anaerobic predation conditions, and we are supplementing with various um, terminal electron acceptors and also electron donors to potentially bolster um, the Della Vibrio growth. So first, we're um, looking at nitrate and glucose. So what you're looking at here is anaerobic predation of E. coli, either with no supplement or supplemented with nitrate, supplemented with glucose, or nitrate and glucose. And what you can see is that really there was no assistance given by the addition of the supplements. There is some slight predation from um, three-hour control just exposed to uh, the, the filtrate of the Della Vibrio without any actual Della Vibrio um, compared to exposure to the Della Vibrio. So potentially this means that there was some initial predation in that three-hour window and then the Della Vibrio died. Um, so we thought, okay, let's, let's look at possible electron donors and acceptors that we could give to Della Vibrio so it can survive these anaerobic conditions. So within the genome, it, there is the possibility of HD100, there is a possibility for it to use nitrite and uh, various electron donors as opposed to um, oxygen for its terminal electron acceptor. So uh, preliminary, just this is the control. Heapies is the broth that we use, or the buffer that we use to just perform regular predations in without supplement. You do see some slight predation after three hours, but none following 24 hours, meaning Della Vibrio likely died. Uh, same with heapies and nitrite, the terminal electron acceptor alone, initial predation, but then likely just Della Vibrio death. But when we supplement with lactate, saw some further predation following the three hour into the 24 hour mark, which is entirely new. That's never been seen before with Della Vibrio. It's not been shown to predate after three hours of anaerobic growth. Uh, and with succinate, that was even more pronounced. However, with uh, other, other supplements, Formate in particular provided a huge jump in three hour to 24 hour predation rates, which is very, very, very new, very exciting. Um, and in the three hours with glutamate, that jump is more pronounced, although the jump at 24 hours is less pronounced. 
So future directions for this research, because it is super preliminary, there are only two biological replicates, so it's really hard to say concretely what's going on. Uh, we'd like to repeat HD100 uh, Delavibrio predation of Fusobacterium nucleatum and confirm each of those strains that I previously mentioned with electron microscopy, as only one strain so far has been done. Additionally, we'd like to further confirm the electron donor and terminal electron acceptor results for anaerobic predation of E. coli and then potentially move that into Fusobacterium nucleatum predation. And we'd also like to look at the potential of targeted predation of Fusobacterium nucleatum. So can we get uh, Bella Vibrio to target virulent strains compared to commensal strains? And can we get it to target Fusobacterium nucleatum in the presence of surrounding decoy microbes, as you might see in a colonic environment? So I'd like to thank um, our collaborators, um, Dr. Robert Mitchell and Wansik Munn, as well as the Alan Verko Lab, and Dr. Alan Verko, who could not be here today. That's a really interesting suggestion. So um, up until recently, there hasn't really been a way to genetically manipulate virulent strains of Fusobacterium nucleatum. There's been some work done in, um, in like ATCC, uh, um, well-studied, well-characterized strains of Fusobacterium nucleatum that have been deposited, genome sequenced. Um, but as for virulent strains, like, like the ones associated with inflammatory bowel disease, colorectal cancer, those have been resistant to all of our genetic modification attempts. Um, a collaborator of ours has recently determined a method to genetically manipulate Fusobacterium nucleatum, but that hasn't really, that's very, very preliminary. So potentially, but that's in the works. So um, Della Vibrio is an interesting organism because it's so good at clearing biofilms. Uh, it actually, in some studies, have shown that it prefers biofilms, the sessile bacteria, because once it enters that predatory phase, grows within the del uh, deloplast, and then lyses, all its prey are right there. So it's really efficient at clearing um, biofilms. Potential, like definitely uh, with more efficiency than uh, antibiotics, but also potentially more efficiently than bacteriophage.